Great. Well, thank you very much, and I'm uh, uh, very pleased to uh, to be here tonight. I think that you are my largest audience yet, which is making me very anxious. <laughs> so we're right on the money when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to the topic that I'll be speaking about tonight. So, how many of you are here uh, because you have concerns about your uh, preschool children? How about your school age child from 6 to 12? And how about your adolescent children, 12 to 39? <laughs> okay. All right. So what I'm going to do, um, what I'm going to do this evening is walk through a number of different um, um, data uh, knowledge bases that um, I am very enthralled with. I'm going to talk to you about the brain because I feel in order to under, really understand um, anxiety, you have to understand what it's about, where it comes from. So we know about lots of kids nowadays who are experiencing more and more anxiety. Are you guys finding that in your daily life, that kids seem to be more anxious now than they used to be? I'm just trying to turn my little device on here, and it keeps wanting to go on hold instead of, it's just like a bell. They put you on hold instead of gives you somebody that you can actually talk to. Oh, well. So, um, the anxiety seems to be going up. And so I want to, whenever I speak, I want to make sure that I give some suggestions that are going to be helpful. And one of the key messages I'm going to have for you tonight is that no matter what the cause of our children's anxiety, and I'll tell you a bit about the statistics, it's very important that we keep in mind the huge buffering, supporting role that we play as the parents and teachers and aunties in, um, uh, in children's lives. So think of yourself as a, a part of the solution. No matter what the issue of anxiety is, the more we help parents be the buffer the people whose eyes light up for our children, then the stronger they're going to be and be able to deal with the challenges that they face. So I've put up my Twitter handle here um, uh, because I have a group of people who say, Jean, you have to tweet. So I have been tweeting, but unlike when I was in the, um, uh, on safari in Kenya, where I had service on my phone. I have no service in frickin' Oakville. <laughs> what gives here? Oh, we're being recorded, so that's the only, um, uh, that's the only frickin' you're gonna hear. <laughs> Though I have to tell you where that, uh, where that phrase actually comes from is a, a teacher, a kindergarten teacher, uh, told me that she had given some books uh, for the kids to read, and the child came up and sat down beside her and said, I want to read to you, miss. And she said, okay. And she said, a freaking elephant. She said, what books did I bring in? And then she looked at it, and it was African. It's all in the emphasis. It's all in the emphasis. So I am, uh, I am a brain geek. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about anxiety in general today, but I have to start right from the beginning to tell you, to make the disclaimer, that this is a general discussion about mental health. I'm not going to be able to make any diagnoses, and I'd hate for anybody to draw uh, definitive conclusions. If you have a concern about your child, we have a healthcare system, um, and you, it would be really important that you talk to your, uh, talk to your family physician or or your pediatrician if you do have ongoing concerns. I want to give you some stuff though that can help with your interactions with your, with your children. So I have a very strong belief after 30 years, I'm going to keep um, my introduction to say almost 30 years as a child psychiatrist. I'm more than 30 years now, but I'll keep it at almost, it keeps me young. But you know, one of the things that has me talking to groups like you is that there is a very big gap between what we know in the scientific literature and what we do and what we pass on. So what we know is that relationships matter. 
And we see more and more today that kids have a poverty of relationships. I'm going to show you how serve and return back and forth builds the brain. How when we have our kids experiencing intense, intense toxic stress, it damages their brain. So what we need to be thinking about in our own lives with our kids is how much are we connecting with them? Our First Nations people believe that every single child should have at least one adult whose eyes light up, who holds them in their hand to help support them. Ideally, there's five people in that. So let me give you another disclaimer before I go on, and that is if I were sponsored by a drug company, because I'm a doctor, I have to tell you, I have no drug company sponsoring me. These are my sponsors. These are my five great kids. My, my great um, uh, cousin is also in the audience, so which is very novel for me. But these are my five great kids. I don't have a couple of others. Jean will confirm that aren't so great. That I don't show pictures of, <laughs> just so you know. So here's my mantra. It's progress, not perfection. As a parent, it's progress, not perfection. We have done everything that we know to do to raise our children well. But I'll tell you, of my five children, several of them have had significant <coughs> issues with anxiety. Some even have had issues with drugs. So I stand before you not as somebody who's going to say, this is what you do to get all right. I stand before you as a mum that says, man, oh man, we can only do the best we can. Progress, not perfection. So I tell you that so that you know you can ask me any question. If you want to know what to do and respond, if one of your children comes home in the back of a police car, drunk out of their minds in handcuffs, I might perhaps have some thoughts on that. <laughs> now you might now be saying, uh-oh, why are we listening to somebody whose kid was in the back of a police car? Well, because our children are gifts. They come to us with all kinds of, of gifts that they are there to teach us. And so I consider one of my children, who will go nameless because his cousin's in the audience, <laughs> the person who has taught me more about the frickin' teenage brain than I ever wanted to know. So we have to recognize that our kids, they come out differently, right? So my first child, Andrew, was so easy we, he got into a nice rhythm, we figured out what, what he needed, and then 18 months later, along came my daughter, and she was a mother killer, <laughs> right? So temperamentally, as a baby, as a baby, I couldn't go back to work. I couldn't go back to work, she would only nurse. She cried if she wasn't with me. So she was intense as an infant. As a toddler, things really bugged her, like the feel of clothes, tags, right? Who knew that socks had lines in them? Oh my God, I didn't know that. But she for sure absolutely did. So we had to figure out the goodness of fit with our girl. And so we got lots of advice. Oh, you know, let her cry it out, hen, it's good for their lungs. That's Scottish for let her cry it out. It's good for her lungs, in case you didn't get the translation. But we knew intuitively that that wasn't the right thing to do. We knew that the only, the only method of communication she had was through crying. You cannot spoil a baby. You have to pick them up and soothe them. And I have to say that one of the concerns that I have with some of the practices out there just now is that there's advice given to let babies cry it out. Well, if you've got easy temperament, then babies, when you leave them down to cry, they may whimper for a minute or two and then go off to sleep. But if you've got kids who are more spirited, raising your spirited child saved us. 
But if they're more spirited, they're the ones who shouldn't be left at all to cry it out because they cry and cry and cry for hours. And so I've seen an upswing in kids whose parents have said that that's what they wanted to, they, that's what they were told to do. That's what they were instructed was the right thing to do. And then their children have incredible anxiety. I was speaking in Ottawa last night and a, uh, a parent came up to me and was talking exactly about this, that her two-year-old continually follows her around, is continually anxiously needing to know where she, where she is. As I spoke to her more, it turns out that she had read or been given advice. And so her little one, who is intensely spirited, has really been affected by that. So we know that infants and little ones cry because they need something. Now when we get to older children, we have to start thinking about, as my friend Stuart Shanker says, if some of the behaviors that we see are in fact stress behaviors rather than misbehaviors. So why do I go on and on about this kind of thing? Well, it's because we really need to be concerned about our children's mental health. What do I mean by mental health? Mental well-being. This is a definition from the World Health Organization. So it's about way more than absence of disease. So they say it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So how do we create well-being? How do we support the development of well-being in our kids? Well, I'll tell you, there isn't a lot of, um, of uh, philosophical drive for that in our Western kind of writings. We have been fed the line of behaviorism, that kids have a, a behavior, there is a reason for the behavior, and then there's a consequence for it. We have not, as our First Nations people have done, we don't have a philosophical home that directs us. Our First Nations people say that our children are the sacred ones. They're the heart of the community. It's our community's responsibility, our sacred responsibility to raise our children. So, you know, we've signed on to the, human, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, but we don't follow it very well. So I'm going to suggest to you that what we need to be thinking tonight is how can we see our children as the gifts that they are? How can we look now to see what are their competences and their capabilities? Because if every child is a gift to us, then we interact with them very differently. If we think our role as parents is to mold them into the people we want them to be, then we'll approach them very differently than if we think that they're a gift and our job is to be like a gardener and create the environment where they thrive. So I'll tell you right up front, I'm very concerned that many of our children are experiencing anxiety because they don't have the base, the five adults whose eyes light up, who spend the time with them to help them fail and do well. We've developed a culture where kids don't fail. Anybody worry about this? Everybody gets a freaking trophy. It used to be you got it if you won, right? Back in the olden days, back in the olden days, we didn't have stickers and stuff. I'm 60 something, but we didn't have stickers and stuff. Now you get stickers for breathing in and out all day. <laughs> well, the self-esteem movement came down and said self-esteem was the most important thing. So you get a sticker here, a sticker there, rewards all over the place. So here's a reality. When I was a kid, when we played musical chairs, you took away a chair. <laughs> yes, indeed. I know. It meant that somebody didn't have a place to sit. 
But that was the point. <laughs> so we have to think about how we are parenting our children now is going to last for the next seven generations. I was told recently that in some um, hockey or in some leagues, the kids no longer call the, toy, the coin toss because they can't deal with the failure of their heads or tails not being selected. I have heard story after story of people, my friends, professors at universities, having parents call up and ask, can you change the mark? My uh, very good friend, Dr. Tracy Viancourt, who's a smart, smart psychologist in Ottawa, told me a story a number of years ago where a mum called up and said, I'm wondering, can you give my daughter two more marks on her assignment because then her grade point average will be high enough for her to apply for medical school? And my sassy friend Tracy said, if she needs her mother to call up for marks, I don't want her to be my doctor. No, thank you. But what's this about? What is this about? Remember that as we're building children's brains, as we're interacting, and the way we're parenting is lasting for generation after generation after generation. Why is it that we have helicopter parents? So it's wonderful to love, 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 love your child. But if you're helicoptering in all the time, the message you're giving them is they can't do it themselves. It's the backside of that loving relationship. So we need to be asking ourselves, how much are we allowing our children to explore the world and fail in a safe way? You don't learn just by failing. You learn by examining your failure. How many kids have we who are able to fail, examine it, come up with a hypothesis what they can do differently and move on? What I see in my clinical practice is more and more kids who say it's too hard, I quit. We have so many kids now who have a fixed mindset We've told our kids they're wonderful, they're smart. While well, science is telling us that when you over and over and over tell your kids they're smart, they start working less hard. We have to tell them instead, not that they're smart, but they've really worked hard. We need to be thinking of supporting their effort rather than telling them they're so smart. Why? Because as soon as something hard comes along, they think, oh, I have, to, I have to work here? I guess maybe I'm not so smart after all. It's like me coming and doing a talk, and somebody says, oh, you know, I heard Dr. Shanker speak the other week, and he was fantastic. I hope you're as good as he is, right? <laughs> You've got these expectations set up instead of uh, supporting effort. So why is this so important? Well, let me just tell you a little bit about my favorite subject, and that is the brain. We now know so much more about the brain than we knew even when I graduated from medical school in 1981. So we used to think, and I had a great time, my first degree, some of you may have noticed, is in music and philosophy. So we would go to the pub, and we'd have a great time having arguments. Is it nature or is it nurture? Is it genes or is it the environment? So it was a great time, but it was a waste of time. Because what we now know is that the genes are hugely important, but the environment turns on or off the genes. So it's genes interacting with the environment. So when we look at things like, you hear my Scottish accent, isn't it lovely? Isn't it lovely? My cousin's is even nicer, isn't it, Jean? Um, so my cousin's Jean as well. Our family doesn't have very much imagination. <laughs> brother married sister, sister married brother, really no imagination whatsoever. 
So I have a Scottish accent because as I was growing up, my first 11 years, my brain cells called neurons were being formed and fired up hearing those sounds, speaking those sounds. So the brain, when a baby is born, there are a hundred billions, I don't know how many billion neurons or nerve cells there are, but they don't know what they're going to be. Any baby who is born is capable of learning and speaking any language whatsoever. They have a brain that is born learning. A brain that is born learning. So now we know that how much talking babies have, how much rocking they have, how much soothing they have, is literally sculpting the brain. But here's the good news. It doesn't just stop in the early years. They, there's a huge explosion in the early years of brain connection. But it doesn't stop there. There's another huge pruning and sculpting that goes on during adolescence. So adolescence is a time when the brain is under construction. All right, all of us who have adolescent children, and that goes from 10 to 28, all of us now say together, under construction. <laughs> we used to think, we used to think it was hormones, but now we know there's massive change going on in the brain. Teenagers are amazingly creative, and do we tap into that in our education system? Teenagers, if you want adolescents, if you want a problem solved, bring it to a bunch teenagers. Why? Because they're under construction and one of the things is they don't have the limits of tr having tried it before. They have so many different ideas. But here's the challenge. As that brain is changing so much in adolescence, while it is plastic in adolescence, it's more vulnerable to things like depression and anxiety. We don't really know why the percentage of kids with anxiety increases as kids get older, but one of the working ideas is that it's because the brain is being changed and molded by what's happening. And when you've got lots of moving parts, you have more vulnerability. So the brain matters. The brain is responsible for who we are. So, it means that our interactions with our kids are really very, very important. This is a picture of the brain, well, a baby before they're even, before you've even know you've missed your first period, well, back in the day when you didn't know that, you know, you now know you're pregnant within about half an hour. <laughs> but back in the day, so here, this picture also, so you see that the brain is developing throughout pregnancy, but it continues to develop throughout life. There's a hugely important book called The Brain That Changes Itself. The Brain That Changes Itself. And it talks about how all of these neurons, they connect up with each other. And the more experience you have problem solving, the better able those areas are connected all up. So the neurons that fire together, wire up together. And as they wire up together, then they get faster at sending signals to each other. So when does this start? Well, it starts in utero, brains wiring up together. This is called brain plasticity. But here's a little video clip that shows you how babies are born learning. Now, I want to bring this into you because I want to lay the foundation that sometimes kids develop anxiety because we as adults are very anxious around them. They are learning and picking up signals from very early on. So this is a little baby who is two weeks of age. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? 
Now he's a beautiful baby with a very handsome young man there. It happens to be my new grandson, <laughs> two months old. But what you see, he, so little Liam doesn't even know that he has a face. He doesn't even know he has a face. And yet here he is, here he is imitating. What's that about? What's that about? It's about connecting. We are a social species. We are a social species. We are wired to connect. So I've been reading the work of, um, of a, a, a Dr. Gordon Neufeld out in, the east, out in the West Coast. I've been reading for many years the work of people who talk about attachment. And one of the things I want us to think about collectively as a group and as a society is having this kind of responsive relationship builds what's called attachment. It builds kids knowing that the world is a safe place. And you measure it by seeing when children are upset, distressed, do they turn to the adults in their life for support? And I'm worrying that because of our stress that we have in our world as adults. When we meet each other, we don't say just, how are you doing? Oh, I'm really busy. I'm really stressed, there's so much going on. Has anybody actually had a conversation that somebody said they were fine and they actually meant they were fine? <laughs> so here we are, we're in a world where we are so amazingly busy and stressed. And so I've had conversations with many teachers and many parents who say, I'm so busy organizing their life around hockey, around gymnastics, around Taekwondo, around Kumon, that I'm the manager of their life, but I don't, I'm not building the kind of relationships with them that you're talking about. I love them to bits, parents tell me about their kids. But they're busy, busy lives. They've made sure the kids have skills of getting ready for school, right? But have they built the skills of getting along with others? And it starts very, very early. It starts very early. How many times in the past month have any of you seen kids playing outside? Hands up. Wow. So that's the most, well, it's the biggest audience I've been in too, but that's the most number of hands. How many of you have been struck by the change in kids' play over the past decade? How many of you have been struck by that? Yes. So here's the back story, I think, of the brain story. So here we've got, this is how you build better brains. Right? Everybody heard this story, right? You build better brains by having flashcards and educational toys and, you know, the guys who did these studies did them with rats. And what they had was rats by themselves, rats with other rats, and then rats in like Disneyland of ratdom. And what they found was that the rats who were in Disneyland had lots of stimulation, their brains were bigger, they remembered things better, and they could swim to an island in their little um, experiment. So they said, wow, experience builds the brain, so let's have lots of enriched experiences and build better brains. The problem is, what works for rats is not what works for humans. What works for humans is this. It's the serve and return, the back and forth, the face to face time, not face time. <laughs> we need to be changing our ratio of face to face time rather than the other. So there's the foundation there's the foundation that I want to lay. I want to show you one other little video clip about how kids are little scientists. These are infants, but our kids still are born and continue to learn. Here's a little guy, oh no he's not. Here's a little guy here, and watch and see what he does here. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
see what's inside the box. You can take the lid off. Is there something in there? There's a green cone. I'm going to put it back inside the box. I put the lid back on the box. I'll close it up. Can I see that? Thank you. Let's see what else we have. Isn't that powerful? So, why do I show you this on a talk about anxiety? Because I want to emphasize that the environments that children grow in build their brains. And that we have not, I would say, we haven't been out front enough about what our kids are being exposed to. That our tension and, ex, um, and, and stress that we experience wherever I go has a contamination effect for our kids. I'm not saying that we as parents are the cause of our children's anxiety. I'm saying though that we are the route through which we can do the buffering for them. So when we're talking about mental health, and we're talking about anxiety. We have to, I want to go de delve a little deeper now into the biology of anxiety because it all has to do with how that brain gets developed. So we think of mental health as a continuum all the way from the blue side there where we have health, we may have occasional stress uh, to mild distress, but no real impairment. And then in the middle or to the, the one side, we've got emotional problems and concerns. And then at the far end, we've got mental illness where there's marked distress. So in our world of child psychiatry and adult psychiatry, how we kind of draw the line between whether you have a problem that's mild to moderate or whether you have a disorder is do you have interference with your day-to-day -day functioning? Is it not allowing you, whatever the mental health issue, not to go to school, not to enjoy your life? Uh, these are the kinds of things that interfere. That's when we call it a disorder. So the question now is, are we actually seeing more kids with the identified disorder? And we don't know the answer to that just yet. We certainly for sure know that more and more kids are reporting that they are distressed. In a recent survey, 38% of over 3,000 kids who were surveys said that at times they have overwhelming anxiety. In the Toronto report that was done, the Ontario Student Drug Use Survey that came out of Toronto, CAMH, about 10% of kids said that they thought about harming themselves. What is the world that we're living in that our kids 
are feeling so, so stressed with the world inside and outside. So when I'm talking about anxiety, what I'm talking about is a lot of a normal behavior and lots of normal experience. We have anxiety for a reason. It becomes problematic when there isn't a good connection between what makes us feel threatened and what is actually happening. So all of us experience anxiety at some point in time. Kids get anxious about bugs, they get anxious about going to sleep at night. I've heard more stories in the past week about four, six, seven-year-olds making the, the rounds of, I can't sleep, I need a drink. There are all kinds of re ways that kids exhibit this. Anxiety can arise from real or imagined. Now, do zebras get anxious? What do you think? Do zebras get anxious? <coughs> Only when they're being chased. As they're eating, chomping away, they're not thinking about the frickin' lion. We are so different. As humans, we can create anxious thinking because we can think about situations before, or even if they never do, arise. So one common definition is apprehension or excessive fear about real or imagined circumstances. And it can come from inside or outside. So, when is anxiety normal? And when I'm talking about anxiety, I'm going to tell you more deeply in the brain where it comes from. I'm talking about our body preparing, our thinking preparing, and we're ready for action. So typical anxiety, you may, it might be a first date, uh, might be preparing for an exam, performing at a concert, giving a speech, moving from home, climbing a tall ladder. So anxiety, you all know this. Remember a time when you felt anxious, you have apprehension, nervousness, tension, but it's transient. It comes and it goes. It doesn't significantly interfere. It doesn't prevent a person from achieving their goals. So anxiety is good for us to have. It is really life-saving to be anxious if you're going down a dark street in New York City, particularly these days. So when we're talking about anxiety, we're talking about your body system being turned on for high alert. So anxiety, we can have our body racing, heart, our tight, uh, tight chest, sore muscles, tummy aches, headaches, nausea, dizziness. So last night I was speaking in Ottawa and I got absolutely swamped by, con by uh, questions um, at the end. And as they were uh, putting all the chairs down, there's all kinds of noise going around, and I have to pack up my computer and keep talking, and then I realized I don't have my purse. And so was I anxious. You bet I was anxious, because I had to get on a plane at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, so that I could be back here, so I could talk to all of you. So I was very nervous. I was very anxious. So I couldn't really focus my thoughts I was thinking, oh my God, would somebody have taken my purse? Did I leave it in the hotel? No, I remember, I remember doing this. I was worrying about, oh my, what am I going to do if I don't have my Nexus Pass? I can't get on the plane. You know, all of these, all of these things going through. My actions, I was, I was, I was fantastic. <laughs> I was just so amazing. Because I was able still to get people to think, yes, I'm paying attention to you. And I was really listening and telling the teachers who were there, can you look over there? Can you look over there? But my actions were very much inhibited. So you get the picture of anxiety affecting your body, your thoughts, and your actions. But then once the anxious um, uh, trigger goes, then your body goes back to normal. So does any of this, though, sound like your child or your youth? Clinging, crying, 
tantrums when you separate. So, this is typical behavior in about three years, uh, children who are three years of age. But with, um, with support and with strategies such as make sure that you say when you're going, I'm really looking forward to seeing you when I come back. So we often hear about children who are in childcare or, in, uh, um, um, or, or starting full day kindergarten, that they're anxious, they have separation anxiety. But if you say, here's something of mummies, here's something of daddies to hold on to, and I'll see you at the end of the day and think you're gonna have lots of stories to tell me. What are you doing in that situation? You are putting the thought of the future in their mind. You are giving them a comfort object so that they can think of you and carry you with you through the day. When does it become a disorder is when the child is not able to function, go to school, carry on. Now here I'll tell you something. I have yet to see a child with separation anxiety who did not have a parent who had separation anxiety too. So babies and children are watching. So one story a, a child said to me who had developed some strategies, um, uh, he and his, um, uh, she and her mum had talked a lot together about how the anxiety that she was experiencing, not wanting to go to school, not wanting to go to birthday parties, not doing the fun things that she wanted to do because she was afraid of germs, she recognized how it was interfering with her life. And her mum said, wow, let's read up on this. And as the mum was reading up on this, she went, holy cow, I've been creating the message to you that the world's a scary place. I didn't mean to, but you know, you were climbing a tree and instead of saying, be careful that you, you might break your arm, I said, you might break your neck. Why? So there's a great uh, TED talk um, uh, by a, a woman, Dawn uh, Humbert, and she talks about how her son was very afraid of wood, so he was 10 or 11 at this age. He was afraid of getting splinters. He was afraid of bees. He was afraid of something else. So um, he was not able to go outside and they were very, very worried. She was a psychologist who wrote about anxiety and here she had this massively anxious son. And so she went to see another psychologist and the psychologist said, well, he has a fear of bees and he has a fear of splinters and maybe he had a fear of needles as well. So he has this fear of long sticking in objects. It's obviously Freudian. It's obviously Oedipus revisited. It's obviously not frickin' that. So she said, I'm gonna read up, I'm gonna develop and she actually went on to become an expert in it. So what did she do? Well, she did some interesting things in terms of trying to help her kid get used to this. He loved Lego. So she bribed him, she and her husband bribed him into going outside. Said, if you go outside and you get stung by a bee, I'll give you 10 bucks. Her husband said, if you go outside and get stung by a bee, I'll give you 20 bucks. So this was them, they were going on this concept of exposure therapy and flooding. But luckily, watch the TED talk, she says, that was so wrong. It was so the wrong way to go about things. If your child has anxieties like this, you break it down for them very slowly into small little steps. You don't jump them, dump them into the swimming pool when they're afraid of swimming. You give them the competency by putting your toe in a little bit at a time. But you also work on the thinking part of it. If the thinking part is saying, oh my God, I'm going to get stung by a whole swarm of bees, I'm going to get allergic reaction, and I'm going to die. Then you have to kind of break it down and say, well, in fact, there's no history of allergy in our family. So the catastrophic thinking 
Bee stings are pretty rare, though unfortunately this little guy went out and immediately got stung. So he got 30 bucks though, so he was able to do it. So, so there are different strategies to use, but here's, this is what we're talking about. Excessive shyness, avoiding social situation, constant worry. There's a great book I'll show you here that's written for kids. Let me just bring it up. That's written for kids um, about, uh, about uh, anxiety. It's written for kids. It comes from the voice of a child who was extremely, extremely anxious. And so it breaks down how being anxious is actually the body's way of saying, be on guard, watch out. But what happened with him is that ever more and more and more, he became anxious about things and couldn't go outside. So it's a great, great, easy, very easy read. So any of you who have, um, um, who have a child, I recommend this free ebook. It's free, just download it. So symptoms of anxiety. And I'm not going to go into the different anxiety disorders tonight. Uh, there, there's, what, what, the, what the world of psychiatry does is it likes to clump stuff together. So there's generalized anxiety disorder who are kids who worry all the time. There's social anxiety disorder, kids who are afraid of going out. Um, uh, and being in social situations. There's phobic anxiety disorder where you've got a specific fear or a phobia. So there's a whole bunch of different ones that you can easily uh, Google, uh, Google and see. I want to tell you about the underlying principles of it. So avoiding situations because of fears, uh, frequent stomach aches and headaches, experiencing sudden panic attacks, if you answered any uh, yes to any of these statements, your child may be experiencing anxiety. And so in teenagers, what does it look like? Recurrent fears and worries, difficulty falling asleep or nightmares, hard to relax, difficulty separating from parents, scared about going to school, irritability, crying and tantrums. So there's a fabulous website called Anxiety BC. Anxiety BC, so for you, those of you in the audience whose teenagers, uh, who, who you're worried about your teenagers, it's a fantastic resource. It's on the slides, but Anxiety BC. Another one is Kelty. The Kelty um, uh, group in British Columbia also has some really great videos. There's a video called, My, uh, a group called Mind Your Mind for Adolescents. So do we need to worry about this? We sure do, because all of this list here are all of the things that we worry about. School failure, absenteeism, classroom disruption, inability to complete basic tasks, family stress for sure. It creates huge family stress and impaired social relationships. So it, we really, we are paying attention to it in a way now that we didn't before. But let me tell you deeper in the brain what is going on with anxiety. So now you've got the impression that the brain is built by experience, but there's also genes. You know, I said to you, I very rarely come across separation anxiety without there being an anxious parent. Well, we know genes are in the mix. We know that there are, they're in the mix, but they are not the whole answer. Why is it? that two kids from one family can have a mum who's anxious and one of the kids anxious, but the other one just so easy going, they can do anything, right? So it's not just genes, it's genes, it's temperament, and it is the interaction of genes and the environment. The good news is, one, we are the solution, and two, if you do need help, beyond the things that I'm talking to you about, then we've got really good therapies that work for children with anxiety disorders. But where is it in the brain? I, I mentioned to you I'm a brain geek, right? I, I'm not a neuroscientist. What I do is I'm a thief. I steal lovely, shiny knowledge from all around and bring it to, uh, uh, to you. So what we know, is that anxiety is a form of stress. And stress is good for us to experience as long as it's not 
overpowering and overwhelming. So there's a great website called the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard. If you're interested in stress, brain development, it's a fantastic place to go to. So positive stress. Um, whenever I do a presentation, I always sweat more. My heart rate is up. I have, uh, it's, it's, but it's pleasant. I want to, I want to um, uh, connect with you and give you information that makes you want to go home and, um, uh, and read more. So it's a positive stress for me. Then there's a tolerable stress. So that's when there's serious temporary stress but is buffered by supportive relationships. So if there's a member of your family who is very ill, you can manage that if you're surrounded by other people who can support you. The stress we worry the most about, though, is toxic stress. And I'll tell you, I'm very worried that as we see an increase in the number of kids reporting feeling very anxious, I'm worried that they are in fact experiencing toxic stress in their daily life. So what happens when we get stressed, when we experience that anxious response? So there's a great website called The Mammoth, or a magazine called The Mammoth Magazine by Dr. Sonia Lupien. And she says the situations that turn our stress response on are nuts. They're novel or unpredictable or they're a threat to the ego, or they create a sense of loss of control. So just think about yourself. When do you start to feel anxious and feel stressed? Is it novelty and unpredictability? I joke all the time that they don't bother me, but they drive my husband crazy. He likes to be an hour ahead of, um, if he has to drive into Toronto for a meeting or be in Toronto, he wants to be there an hour ahead. Me, I think of what I could do with the hour, right? When we're, when we're traveling and we're in, in the international, you know, if you're waiting in between planes, I love going out and exploring, you know, trying new perfumes and stuff. He sits there and frets in case I'm gonna miss the plane. I've never missed a freaking plane. <laughs> but he hates that unpredictability. Threat to the ego. So that's if somebody is going to diss you, somebody is going to disrespect you, or somebody's going to say, you know, oh, well, you know, I liked your talk last time better than this time, right? Or a sense of loss of control, that's mine. That's my big stressor. But I didn't know this before I had five children. So think about your own kids. When do they go nuts? <coughs> What is the situation that you see them more anxious in? Is it before a test? Is it when they're going out to a social event? Because if you can help them recognize what the trigger might be, and then you can tell them about how the brain works, then you can claw in and bring in some supports to help them deal with it. So how does the brain work when it's nuts around? So what we know is that deep inside our brain, there's a little organ on each side of the brain called the amygdala, and it's the fight, flight, or freeze area of the brain. So when we sense a snake, when we see a snake, there's a signal that goes up very, very quickly to our be on guard. It is so fast, here's a story. I had a friend tell me this story. She had people coming over to play cards. And one of the women, after just a few minutes, started to get wheezy. And she said, do you have a cat, Diane? You know I'm allergic to cats, right? And she said, no, I don't have a cat. That's why we're here. And nobody else has cats. She said, I'm getting so wheezy, I'm gonna have to go. And in the silence, as they're kind of going, oh, the fridge turns on. And it goes, meow. Her body, her amygdala, had picked up that sound, recognized it as a threat, and had turned on the signal to get the puck out of here. <laughs> so when we have that, it is deep inside the brain, but it affects our guts. 
When we are on the fight, flight, or freeze um, signal, be on guard, watch out, it's dangerous, the blood starts flowing to be preparing you to be safe. So it's not worrying, your brain is not worrying about digesting your food or reproduction. So things go north and your gut hurts because it's not getting the blood supply. So you know how kids say that they've got stomach aches and you say they don't really? Well, they actually do if they're in this state of anxiety. So this physiological arousal is a fancy term for being on guard. So when kids are anxious, their brain is picking up something in the environment that they think is anxiety, danger, and their body turns on their, uh, the adrenaline so they can run fast, cortisol so they can keep running. So when is it a problem? It's really important if you're walking down the street and a big dog lunges at you, you go whang and you run away. And that book that I showed you, the young fellow Casey talks, or the young girl Casey talks about one day her cat was just lying down on the porch and then this big dog came up. The, the cat arches its back, gets puffy um, um, uh, fur. The eyes get bigger and makes out a deep growling sound. That is the amygdala in action in cats. The equivalent in us is our pupils get bigger. We don't have blood going to our, our, our gut. We've got it going to our large muscles. So what happens when it is a problem is when there's no danger and the system gets turned on. So the brain registers that there's danger. Why? Because we as humans are one of the few species we know of so far that can turn this system on by thinking about it. Remember the zebra? The zebra doesn't have anxiety. There's a great book called Do Zebras Get Ulcers? They don't get ulcers as well, I guess. Somebody told me they do if they're in captivity. But the problem here is that when you sense danger and it's not there, you have to train your brain. You have to train your brain. Why do we worry about it happening too much? Because, and this is one of the worries that many of us in the field have, when you have a bombardment of your brain perceiving that you're anxious and there's something dangerous going on, your whole body gets bombarded by adrenaline, by cortisol. You've got a hippocampus, which is new learning and memory, which in ordinary circumstances would say, oh, it's okay, it's all right, it's not fearful now, it can just quiet down. But in anxiety, the hippocampus is not able to reach the anxious brain and it keeps firing. So here's a way I think of and use with my, uh, with my patients when I'm talking about anxiety. So I think of the amygdala. Now remember, I'm a shrink, so I get to play with puppets. So I think of the amygdala like my little porcupine puppet here. So when it senses danger, the prickles go up and the prickles send out signals to release adrenaline, to release cortisol. So here we've got the prickles, release through the amygdala, down to the adrenals to release adrenaline and release cortisol. Now he has a good buddy called the hippocampus, which is new learning and memory. So your hippocampi are bigger now than when you walked in here tonight. Can't you just feel it? If you were truly in the zen of it, I'm sure you wouldn't. Anyway, so here we've got these two guys working well together. When the hippocampus, it says, oh, do you know what? Don't worry, Jean, it's not, it's not a snake, it's a cord. And it neutralizes, it brings down the stress. What we worry about, though, is when the porcupine is firing, 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 the hippocampus doesn't have access. This is a non-teachable moment. As you think about your kids with anxiety, can't you just see their porcupines prickling? 
As we worry about our kids with anxiety, don't you feel our own porcupine brains firing? So this is the non-teachable moment. But one of my, uh, one of my little girl's uh, patients told me that what she does with her anxiety as an example is instead of the adrenaline and the cortisol going down, she imagines her porcupine, her amygdala, she visualizes sucking that, um, that up. That the amygdala, instead of shooting out these hormones, is actually bringing them up. So she visualizes when she's about to be in an anxious situation, actually bringing in the amygdala, bringing in the adrenaline and bringing in the cortisol. So we know that it changes the brain. But I'll tell you, the good news is we can rewire the brain. What can you do? So here are some strategies that you can take home. One of the biggest things that parents that come to me say they wish they had never done was told their, told their kids, don't be anxious. There's nothing to be anxious about. They want to just kind of suck those words back because they see that it doesn't help. So what can you do? So be patient, calm, and reassuring. Now, sometimes that's really hard because if your kid is not going to school anymore because they're so anxious, it's pretty hard to be patient, calm, and reassuring. But when they're having the deepest trouble is when you really have to be patient and calm. Be positive about their ability to manage the situation with support. So what you have to learn about, we are not going to be, I wouldn't be able to in this in an evening talk, but what you need to do, um, I would suggest you can start with that lovely little book and learn more about cognitive behavior therapy. So we can do this, we do this all the time. What we think affects how we feel, affects how we act. So if the thoughts are overwhelming but also wrong, so that's one of the key things about anxiety, that the thoughts that the child has are actually inaccurate. They catastrophize. They think, if I fail this test, if I fail this test, absolutely everything is going to go downhill. One young boy I saw who was 16 uh, in high school was terrified of not doing well in math because he loved computers. And if he didn't do well in math, then he was never going to be able to have the computer career that he wanted to have. And he perseverated on, I'm never going to get high enough marks. He was so busy, you guys can get this picture, he was so busy worrying that he wasn't going to get high enough marks that his brain, his thoughts were wiring and going, 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 so he did, wasn't able to actually study. So by stopping the thinking, of I'm never going to get high enough marks to break it down and say, how about we focus on what you need to know for this test? What do you need to know for this test? And how are you going to learn that? So breaking it down into small parts, he had catastrophized into, I'm going to end up on the street a bum, homeless, without any education. That's catastrophizing, right? So breaking it down, be a, uh, you can do this you are able to break it down for them. Help them succeed by doing these small steps. Reward and praise your child's efforts as well as successes. You know, you didn't think that you were gonna be able to go to that birthday party, but you stayed for a whole hour. How does that feel that you were able to do that? Be a model for your child, this is a big one, huh? Manage your own anxieties. Help your child avoid avoidance. So what happens is a child will um, have one experience and then they avoid it. And as they avoid it, they don't go to school. They've got tummy ache, they don't go to school. And mom says, okay, well, I'll drive you to school. They don't want to go on the bus. So mom wants everybody to be happy or dad wants everybody to ha be happy. So they say, okay, well, I'll drive you to school and drive you to school and then you're crying getting out of the car. And so I'll walk you into the school. And then you walk the child into the school um, and then you cry when your mom has to go. And so it, you, you see how it, we, we feed into it and it builds and builds and builds and builds. So we have to look at our own um, avoiding avoidance. What else can you do? 
These are very practical and very useful skills. Teach them relaxation. So there's a very simple relaxation technique that many people are now using, and that's at various points in the day, take three big breaths in and three big breaths out. Well, no, I guess you have to do both at the same time <laughs> rather than separate, but you know. The other, the other is teach your child to visualize or imagine a pleasant, relaxing, happy space. How many of you have a happy space in your head that you can go to? Look, it's so few. I, was, I had this, this um, eye-opening experience. I was in Michael Kors in Toronto. <laughs> So I was in Michael Kors in Toronto, and there was a young girl who was, I don't know, she was 21, 22, I don't know, but she was trying on a bag that I couldn't afford. Anyway, she's trying on and her phone rings, and just listening to the conversation because she was speaking quite loudly, well, um, I got the impression that she was in a course, and this was one of her friends who was also in the course, who was calling to say that the marks were up. And she said, no, I'm not going to look and see, I'm in my happy place. Now, I have to say that there ain't many people I know whose happy place is a Michael Kors trying on a $700 frickin' bag. But sometimes it can just be a mountain shot. Sometimes it can be just a place where you feel very calm. My happy place is my living room. And if it's too messy to think about it, then I think about the needle shop, the needlepoint store that I love to go and buy and look at stuff. So really, guys, go here from tonight and think about where is my happy place? Where in my mind can I create a space of just being fully present in the moment and enjoying that moment? A lot of work is now being done on understanding how mindfulness meditation is helping people with anxiety, with depression, and just with the day-to-day -day work of living in 2016. Keeping stress low at home. You know, I showed you that picture, that little video clip of the little boy who had um, uh, the, you know, with the experiment with the, the noisy toy. So that same lab has done some remarkable research about how kids pick up what's going on. They take infants of parents who say that they're in high conflict. So babies who have high conflict and they compare them to babies whose families say they don't have high conflict. The babies are, are put in this fancy big machine that looks like a massive hair dryer, old fashioned hair dryer, and they fall asleep. As they're asleep, the machine is reading the brain waves and can tell pictures of what's happening with their amygdala. So what they then have is a soundtrack in the background of yelling. The babies whose parents don't have conflict, their amygdala just stays asleep. But the babies who are still asleep, whose parents have high conflict, as they hear that yelling, their brains start turning on in their amygdala. Remember, this is fight or flight. So we might think babies are too little, or we might think, well, as long as we don't argue in front of the kids, then it's all right. The message here is no. Kids are picking up the sounds, even if you're in other rooms. And what's more important is that you learn how to deal with the conflict between yourselves and the stress. So of course there's these, the, um, the healthy living, enough fun uh, in your life and you have lots of sleep. So the tool that are recommended, and you know this, this is good for adults as well. So externalize the worry. So instead of being so, so very fretful, you say, that's my anxiety bugging me yet again, right? So you're going into a social situation and you start thinking and catastrophizing. I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to say blurt out fat when I'm talking to fat people. I don't know what your worry might be. 
But so what you do is you say, that's my worry talking. That's my worry talking. I'm going to put that over there. When I do count, um, counseling or support to medical students and residents, sometimes they're very worried about what's going on in the emergency room. They worry, oh, I'm not going to be able to get through all of the patients. And that worry in itself starts frying up their brain, right? Well, what they think affects how they feel, affects how they act. So I help them go into, say, go into the zen of this say that's my anxiety talking and they can use whatever phrase works for them which might be frick right off anxiety but they externalize it is that making sense you have the anxiety push it out correct thinking mistakes i've talked about that the catastrophizing and then the exposure so doing it by small small gradual steps so here's a question for you now and this is the work now of, um, this is, well, first of all, how do we spend our time with our kids? Do we spend our time connecting with them or correcting them? If we were to do a ratio of are we connecting or directing and redirecting, what would we be saying it is? I want to talk about a different kind of connection. And this is the work of Gord Neufeld. So, so many of you here are here with issues and concerns about your teenagers. He has a hypothesis, Gord Neufeld does, as well as Dr. Michael Chang, a great guy from Machio in Ottawa, that kids, as they get older, naturally the adolescents are drawn to make connections with their peers. One of the misconceptions is connection with the peer mean they have to, means they have to break connections with their parents. That is just not true. You don't have to break connection with your, with your parents as you're connecting with your peers. And in fact, kids who have positive relationships with their parents do far better navigating through adolescence. But here's the concern that we have in 2016, that peers are more connected, that sorry, that adolescents are more connected to their peers technol and technology and things. That we've got this poverty of relationships that kids talk about. You know, when people survey children or young, young adults uh, and teenagers, and they, you ask them, well, what would you like to see changed? What about your parents? What would you like to see? I want to see my parents less stressed. They ask kids about what's really important to them with their family. And you know, parents think that it's going to be all the great trips that they went on. But kids say it's the time that we got to chill together, just not doing anything special. So kids are telling us that they are in need of more of our time and more of our connection. So. Are we connecting with them or are we correcting them? How many of you are guilty of being on this instead of being present with your kids? Now, we're not saying all of the time, but there's an increasing concern about childhood and the media. Now, look at this guy here. If he was in my house, he would not reproduce again. <laughs> right? Oh, no, sorry, he's, he's, he's just sending an Instagram, isn't he? Right. So here's a caveat. Here's something to be paying attention to, guys. We have been given a bill of goods that says that if it's technological, if it's media, if it says it's educational, then it's good. You think? You think the eye potty is required? How about the activity swing? So here we are, the, yeah, the little chair there for children under six months. Let's make sure that we get the iPad so that we can stuff the duck. We can stuff their brain with stuff. So we need to be asking ourselves some pretty tough questions. How much are we connecting? And I don't mean in this kind of a way. I love this. 
I love this for connecting with my kids. You know, I have one daughter just now who's in Guyana, I have another who's in Vancouver, and I have a son who's in Colombia. So I love WhatsApp. We're finding out lots of good things, staying connected. But Gord Neufeld wants us to question, how connected are you to your child? He has a hypothesis. He's written a book called Hold On To Your Kids. I want to share this with you. I'm just kind of exploring it myself, um, uh, his thinking about the connection between attachment and this anxiety. I'm not convinced that it's that straightforward. But he does ask some really important questions. And ask yourself, do you and your child spend one-on-one -on -one time together? Do you have things in common? So one of my kids, who was not very interested in school at all, he introduced me to Pink Floyd. Right Now, I should know all about Pink Floyd. They were in Hamilton in 1974. My brother went, but I was into classical music. But we connected around Pink Floyd. Who knows Pink Floyd's amazing musicality? Like, un frickin' real How did I miss that? So how can we, parents were asking me last night, how do you connect with a teenager who's disconnected to you? Well, you find out what are the things that you might have in common. You prioritize each other's relationship over other competing distractions and relationships. How many of you make sure that whenever you come into the house, you call, you call out, hello, I'm home, who's here? How, how many of you make sure that you have family meals together at least once a week? We have really great science that shows that the fewer times you have family meals, the earlier kids get into sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Your relationship counts to your teenage kids. Do not buy the crapola that's out there that says that kids don't need us anymore when they get to adolescence. Thank you very much. Yes. Don't buy it. It's not true. Where are we getting these myths? Well, my friend Dr. Michael Cheng, who's got a wonderful um, uh, presentation online, talks about the, what everybody is doing on television. What's the role of the parent? Well, they're all, duh, you know, think Simpsons. So we have to recreate. How much do you enjoy doing things and being helpful for each other? How often do you express affection to each other? Does your child openly come to share how he's feeling or example for emotional support? So he looks to this and says, how are we doing in our relationships with our kids? I want to reiterate, I am not saying that parents are causing their children's anxiety. I think it is far, far, far more complex than that. But I absolutely think we are the answer for our kids and helping them understand and giving them the tools that I mentioned by looking up that the, this, the, um, uh, the resource that I mentioned here, playing with anxiety, it's good. It's very, very good. You can read it, you can share parts of it with your, with your child. It walks through a really beautiful way of solving the worry puzzle. Solving the worry puzzle by knowing, yes, I am going to worry, but how can I be the boss of my worrying? Make a plan. Make a plan of how am I going to break it down into smaller parts? How am I going to externalize that worry so it is outside of myself? Talk to your worry. Be unsure and uncomfortable on purpose. We have to encourage our kids to fail and learn how to deal with that failure. You learn by examining, not just by failing. So they need us to be with them on this journey. So let me finish because we want to have, um, we want to have, we're going to set up microphones now. We didn't want anybody to trip. But let me finish just with a small story. And it's about um, our, our Cree. I learned this story when I was out west at a First Nations conference. 
The Cree believe that the elders have much to teach. And they, uh, this elder is talking and he says, you know, life is really tough. We've got good in us and we've got bad in us. And it's almost as if we've got two wolves uh, fighting inside. You know, should I do my homework now? Um, or should I clean up the kitchen now? Or, or, um, or should I watch one more episode of Call the Midwife? Should I, you know, uh, so these tussles, am I going to be good and pleasant and loving? And the other one is fighting and saying angry, jealous, mad. And one of the little ones up front really gets this picture of these two wolves fighting. And he says, grandfather, tell me, which one wins? And he says, it depends which one you feed the most. It depends which one you feed the most. I hope from this evening you've got a better sense of how does the brain work when it comes to anxiety? How does our relationship and our connection connection, connection to our kid help buffer that anxiety? And how can we, using great resources, help them on a day-to-day -day basis deal with it? So I hope that you have been fed well enough to have some good questions or, or just comments that I will look forward to answer. So thanks very much, guys. You've been a fantastic audience. Lots of feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.